Uh, hello everyone. This is Masoud from Tehran. And tonight I'm your host. Uh, our tonight's speaker is Professor Ramot Gorsoy. He has received his PhD from MIT in 2005. Then he had several postdoc positions at CPHT, Utrecht University, and CERN. Now he is an associated, associate professor at Utrecht University. His main interest in understanding the strongly coupled media through holographic approaches, if I am right. And for the questions, you can raise your hands during the talk for short questions and please keep the long discussions when or when the talk is finished. So Omut, please. Okay, well, thank you very much for the for this nice introduction and for the invitation. I hope uh, everybody is healthy and uh, staying healthy and um, also mentally healthy, of course. Um, so today I will I will be telling you about uh, some recent work that we have uh, we have been um, doing so this problem of um, spin currents in relativistic systems and uh, that can be described by uh, hydrodynamics um, that we've been thinking about for some time and so this talk is going to be based on the first paper here by the way can you see my cursor Masoud yes yes okay so this first paper which is uh, from last month uh, but also we have, we had a paper with my uh, student um, PhD student Domingo Gallegos um, uh, some time ago, essentially describing the holographic aspects of um, spin currents, coherent spin currents in strongly correlated systems. So, but this talk itself will be mostly based on uh, this first paper together with Amos Yarum uh, from Technion and and Domingo. So the um, well. Spin transport is, is playing um, a more and more prominent role in, in, in many different uh, fields, diverse fields ranging from spintronics to, to astrophysics to coagulum plasma, astrophysics, and many different uh, aspects, uh, many different uh, questions, problems in physics. And, and essentially because, um, well, in spintronics, you know that there's, there's, this, there's this big promise that, um, Spintronics is going to replace electronics in the near future, which is going to be based on, so the information transfer is going to be based on uh, spin degrees of freedom rather than elect electri electron, electric degrees of the electrons. And that is, uh, that is going to solve many heat pro associated problems, etc. But for us, for, for this audience, I think the more important um, um, application will be in, in quark gluon plasma, which is essentially, uh, which contains uh, particles with, with spin, so uh, there is a possibility of creating some coherent tr spin transport as well. And that may play some important roles, especially in, in also in, in different uh, topics that I didn't list here. So this dot, 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 like in astrophysics, neutron stars, magnetars, whatever, and, and early cosmology. Even. Um, a part of this motivation is based on the, um, the recent experiments. So there are two experiments I will, um, I will tell you about. Uh, and only briefly, right? So just one slide because the rest of the talk is going to be theoretical. Um, so the, the first experiment which concerns this audience mostly is, uh, is the observation of um, a global polarization of a particular type of particles, uh, which is a piperon particle in the quark gluon plasma in the off-central um, heavy ion collisions. So if you, when you have an off-central heavy ion collision, as shown in this, in this figure here, as this is the cartoon of that uh, collision, there's an impact parameter. And as a result, there's a total angular momentum in the system carried by the beams, which somehow trans transferred into the, um, the vorticity in the, um, in the, in the created coagulum plasma. And that you can roughly understand by, by looking at this picture, essentially, that I just stole from, um, from Francesco's paper in 1917. Uh, in 2017, which is essentially the, so if you consider this off-central collision, you have these different velocity gradients and this different velocity gradients is creating some vorticity in the quark plasma. 
And once we have vorticity, which means that we have some angular momentum, because of the spin orbit coupling in the system, the spins of these uh, of the particles in the quark Coulomb plasma are going to be um, <clears throat> aligned with the with the angular momentum or with the vorticity in the system. And what makes these uh, lambda uh, hyperon particles special is that you can detect their polarization easily because they decay, as shown in this figure. They they decay these lamb lambda hyperons. They decay into a, a proton, and uh, their polarization is more more or less aligned with the with the with the momentum of the proton they emit. So by observing those protons, essentially you can read off uh, relatively easier the total polarization in the um, in the in the in, of these hyperon particles in the experiment, from which you can infer the value of the vorticity present in the system. And of course, you get these astronomic numbers. We are all used to these astronomic numbers also from the magnetic field in the quark Coulomb plasma and all that. But this is this turns out to be, of course, uh, an important result that this is a most vertical fluid. Okay. And here in this picture, you see the, the average polarization of uh, the hyperon particles. So this, this quantity here um, um, of hyperons and lambda, so lambdas and lambda bars which are affected by the presence of a magnetic field differently. That's why these, you see different curves. In, in the rest of this talk, I will be assuming that uh, there is no magnetic field. Of course there is, but I will, I will ignore the magnetic field. So for me, uh, what I would like to do is, uh, I would like to reproduce this figure by using hydrodynamics, but uh, the average of those two. Okay, so the lambdas and lambda bars. Okay, so um, the, the bottom line of this, um, this slide is that there are so many assumptions okay, going into this, the, the derivation of this figure, this, this, uh, this, this number also. And I would like to understand this by, uh, from the hydrodynamic, uh, hydrodynamics point of view, whether do we include all kinds of different effects or you know, transport effects and they may change the result, the vorticity and in, in different ways. So that's, uh, it would be good to, to establish some, uh, a, a, an alternative approach uh, based on relativistic hydrodynamics to, to understand this global polarization. So that's my uh, motivation. And another motivation comes from a different corner of physics from a condensed matter. So essentially um, that, that, is, uh, that is called liquid spintronic. So you consider essentially some kind of a liquid metal um, like mercury or, uh, or uh, gallium, indium, selenium um, compound, something like this. And what they do here is that you're all familiar with this kind of experiment. When you have a, a fluid, the charged fluid that is flowing in a tube in the presence of a magnetic field because of the Lorentz force, you will generate some electric voltage across the tube. So the same thing happens if you consider a flow of a fluid, uh, again, uh, with, with the spin, okay, so it contains fermions and, uh, and in the presence of a vorticity. In the presence of vorticity, the analog effect is the is a production, the generation of a spin voltage across the tube. And the reason is, is essentially the same. So the, the same as uh, this picture here. So here the vorticity was generated by a difference in the velocity, so the velocity gradients, the difference in the magnitudes of, and the, um, uh, of, the, of, the, of the velocity. Here the same thing is happening because of the friction on the, on, the, on the boundary of the tube Essentially, you have uh, some other velocity of the liquid metal here. Uh, maximum velocity is in the middle, and that essentially creates some kind of uh, a different um, magnitude and direction of the of the vorticity in the fluid. And the gradient of uh, so the current, the spin current, is associated to the gradient of the of the vorticity, and also spin chemical potential uh, is associated to the vorticity, the magnitude of the vorticity itself. So this is the the kind of experiment which is the if you like the analog of what we have been observing. Uh, in the quark Coulomb plasma. So both of them are um, experimental motivations for a theoretical study of uh, spin current um, uh, by, by using hydrodynamics, because essentially hydrodynamics is, uh, is believed, we believe that hydrodynamics is a, the universal description that, um, that, that should apply to uh, diverse, diverse fields. So that's my working assumption. I'm of course assuming that the, there are strong correlations in the system uh, such that hydrodynamic description is going to apply. If that doesn't apply, our results are not going to be valid. Okay, so, um, and please uh, stop me at any time and, uh, and ask, ask your questions as Masoud uh, mentioned, I'm, uh, you're very welcome. Um, so the, and I will, since there's 90 minutes, I will be keep going a little bit slow 
for, for those of you who are very familiar with the, the basics of hydrodynamics and, and many other things that I will be talking about, please bear with me. Um, I, I hope you're not going to get bored, uh, but I, I prefer to go a little bit slower because this is relatively a new, new, new thing. But once we get to, uh, to spin part, that will be, uh, there will be some new concepts. So, um, but let's establish the, um, the common language first, that is the hydrodynamics. Uh, and the, the modern understanding of hydrodynamics today is essentially as an effective field theory of uh, conserved quantities in a quantum field theoretical system. So you can consider dividing the degrees of freedom in your quantum field theory into two different um, groups, fast variables and, uh, and slow variables. And at the same time, you assume that there is some notion of thermal equilibrium. So in mathematical terms, there exists some killing vector in your system. Uh, respective to that killing vector, you can define the thermal equilibrium. So this is that, uh, that dashed line is essentially denoting the thermal equilibrium. And then you can make a perturbation on the thermal equilibrium. And these fast variables can decay, relax back to the thermal equilibrium uh, much faster than the conserved quantities because these fast variables are the non-conserved quantities. They can change their magnitude in a, in a given space time point. But the conserved quantities cannot change their magnitude to change their magnitude, essentially, they have to be transported to another point in space and time. So that, that, is, uh, that leads to transport. So they can only relax through transport. That's why they, they relax lower. So if you consider a system like this uh, with a perturbed thermal equilibrium state, then uh, if you wait long enough, the, the system is effectively going to be uh, described by, by the slow variables. And this can be organized in a derivative expansion so this relaxation time for the fast relaxation time for the fast variables. Uh, uh, so you can, you can essentially construct these derivatives in time and, uh, and the gradients in space. And you can organize, you can expand your action in a derivative expansion that, that, uh, that is the hydrodynamic, that will give the hydrodynamic description of the system. So this is something I, uh, I, I hope everybody is uh, familiar with. And um, so what, what I would, want to do here in this talk is uh, to, 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 to construct um, the hydrodynamics with the spin current essentially by treating, tra treating the, um, the slow variables as the energy momentum tensor and the spin current. So th there will be two different um, uh, degrees of freedom. The energy momentum tensor should always be there. Of course, energy and momentum are the basic variables that we always transport in this kind of systems. And I will be assuming that there is some notion of a coherent spin flow in the system which can also be, um, uh, uh, be part of the description. Okay, so that's a working assumption. So here, this, uh, this spin operator is, um, so this lambda is the, the flow direction. So that's proportional to, if you like, this U lambda, that is the fluid variable. And mu nu is the, um, denotes um, the, um, the, 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 rotate, the, the plane uh, perpendicular. So the spins are perpendicular to this, uh, to this plane mu nu. So if you consider this, for example, in the space components, when, when this is one, two, we will be talking about spins in the three direction transported uh, along the lambda direction. Okay. This, these are, of course, relativistic generalizations of those notions. And um, so this is, I mean, this work is, of course, a continuation of what has been done before. It, it all started a long time ago um, in 2008, or even, even it dates back to, to earlier uh, papers, which um, I am sorry not to include all the all the references. These are the kind of references that I've uh, looked at, and um, there were. So I just want to salute to the earlier earlier work and on the subject, and and there are different kind of approaches, especially in the context of QCD. Uh, most of the earlier approaches was were based on either kinetic theory or or perturbative QCD or uh, or, or other uh, approaches that. Um, and so, for example, I think I. Uh, by mistake, I, I forgot uh, Giorgio's uh, approach, uh, approach based on um, Lagrangian description uh, here. Um, but um, that's also one of the important uh, works that uh, played a role importantly, important role in the previous uh, um, descriptions. But I will be, um, I mean, enough, another reason that I'm showing these earlier works is essentially that I will be doing something slightly different um, that I want to construct it, taking a different approach, not necessarily assuming that you know, kinetic theory is, is, is valid. I just want to assume uh, that the hydrodynamics uh, based on symmetry principles 
uh, is enough to describe the spin transport in the system. And let's see how far we can get with that. So um, I will be describing hydrodynamics based on an action formalism. So the action formalism, this is relatively uh, recent, um, uh, you know, much later than, of course, the works of uh, BRSSS or um, you know, Israel, uh, Miller Israel Stewart description of hydrodynamics. This is, uh, this is based on an action formalism, which allows you to, um, to derive the constraints that would come from uh, positive entropy production, for example, much easier if they automatically come from the action. Section. So that's the nice thing about the action formalism. And that, that, is, a, that is an easier way to, to derive and, and more systematic way to derive um, spin transport also for us. So what I want to do here now is to, um, to give the first, first I would like to give an example of this action formalism, how it works, to, um, to, to establish notation, if you like, and, and the concepts. And then we will be generalizing this to, to the spin currents. But uh, so this is just an example. Please um, don't, don't get confused. I will, never, I will not be talking about charged fluids from now on. So only on this, on this slide, I will be giving this as an example because this is more familiar. So let's um, consider um, a description of a charged fluid using this hydrodynamics in the action formalism. For that, um, uh, I, we assume that there is a charged fluid, a relativistic charged fluid in the presence of external sources. So the external sources that are playing, that are dual, the conjugate to the, the, um, to the slow variables in the system are the metric and, uh, and the gauge field, an external gauge field, because these will be dual to energy momentum tensor and the, and the, and the current, the charge current. And then what you do is you write down the most general scalar constructed out of these, um, these external fields, which I'll be denoting by this W. So W is a functional of, uh, of the metric and the, uh, and the external gauge field. And then you require um, diffeomorphism and gauge invariance in this, uh, of this action. So those are the basic um, um, system symmetries that I was referring to before. So in this particular case, you, those symmetries are the gauge invariance and the diffeomorphism. And once you demand, for example, gauge invariance, everybody is familiar with the fact that when you assume that the external gauge field, so the system is uh, invariant under the gauge transformation of the external gauge field, you would automatically get uh, the, the conservation of the charge current. Uh, also, if you assume diffeomorphism invariance and make uh, assume that the Lie derivative of the, of the external fields vanish, then you would get immediately the, the conservation equation for the energy momentum transfer. In the presence of an external gauge field, of course, on the right-hand side, you also have this, um, this work term. So this is a work um, um, on the system coming from the, uh, the current. So the work is doing something. So the, the external gauge field is doing some current on the system, on the uh, work on the system. So this is, this is, this is uh, how you derive the hydrodynamic equations from the action based on symmetries completely. And then you, you demand, you assume that there's some notion of a terminal equilibrium. So there exists some killing like some, some time like killing vector that I will be denoting by psi. And from which you can define the basic uh, hydrodynamic variables. So the magnitude of this killing vector is going to give you, for example, the, the, temp the inverse temperature. The killing vector itself normalized by its magnitude is going to give the define for you the, the fluid velocity. And then from this external uh, gauge field and the fluid velocity itself, you can construct, for example, the, the chemical potential. And all these quantities are, are uh, dynamical variables. So they are, they are functions of uh, space time. And then you want to determine these functions of space time by, by inserting here, by solving these equations. But what you see immediately is that the number of degrees of freedom uh, here and here are essentially, so, so the, you want to solve, if you want to solve these equations by themselves, you see immediately that T mu has uh, many more degrees of freedom than the, than the equations. Right? So, and J mu itself as well. So here, this is a single equation, but J mu has four degrees of freedom. This T mu has 10 degrees of freedom in four dimensions, but this is, a, this is four different equations, etc. So what you need is, uh, is this extra assumption that would come from the constitutive relations. And this is exactly that. So what you need is to reduce these um, um, slow variables, T mu nu and J mu, to these dynamical variables um, that I'm calling dynamical variables by using some constitutive relations. And this is where the derivative expansion is playing an important role. So the two different um, 
um, components of the hydrodynamic description, well, three is one is the symmetries and the action formalism, and then you derive the hydrodynamic equations and then the constitutive relations. So those are the important things. So we would like to apply the same set of rules, the same prescription in deriving, uh, for, to derive essentially um, the, the spin current coupled to the energy momentum tensor. And so that is the, the purpose of this talk. So this is the bottom line. Uh, and in analogy with this external fields, in this case, what we have is, uh, well, first of all, you have to identify what couples in your, uh, in your system, in your diffeomorphism invariant system, what couples to the spin of particles. So what that, what we know that, we know that quantity that is called the spin connection. So you can see that here, the, the uh, general, so this is, this is almost like general relativity, which is not dynamical, right? So you know, if I add it to this, this uh, rich scalar term and make, make metric dynamical, this would be uh, general relativity coupled to, coupled to matter. So in this case, uh, we, we do the same thing. So here from, by, we already know uh, that in, in, in a general relativistic description, uh, the, the quantity that would couple to the spin degrees of freedom would be the spin connection. And what would be playing the role of the metric in that case would be the field bind. So this is called the first order um, formalism for, for general relativity. It's a little bit different than, uh, than Einstein's formulation, but which is completely equivalent in the absence of uh, torsion. So we will come to that later. So this is, this, this is essentially the, um, <clears throat> the upshot. What I want to do is to, to, do, to, to, con to, to construct this um, um, hydrodynamic description of a system based on an action formalism, where the action will be um, some, the most general quantity that we can write down uh, out of this field bind, which couples to the energy momentum, and the spin connection, which couples to the spin, spin current. So let me pause a minute to, to see if there are any questions. Uh, is there any question? So if there is, any, there is no question from the audience, okay. I want to ask, uh, you are not assuming torsion here, yeah? In this room. Yeah, I will, uh, not, not at the moment, but you will see it next in, on the next page. Okay. So, well, thanks for asking that question because I think torsion, uh, it's right on the, to the point, the torsion is going to play an important role. And this is what I was um, <clears throat> essentially inviting this question uh, in some sense. And um, because of the following fact. So before we do this, you have to address a, a very important question. So there is, a, there is, of course, in quantum field theory, there is a familiar ambiguity of the spin current. You can. We define what the quantity that we define um, um, is just a second. Just. Right. Yeah, the quantity that we that is uh, that is conserved is the total angular momentum in the quantum field theory. So the total angular momentum is divided into two different parts: the orbital part, the orbital angular momentum, and the spin. Um, so the, the angular momentum carried by the spin degrees of freedom. And the associated conservation laws or uh, the energy momentum conservation and the, and the conservation of the angular momentum, the total angular momentum is preserved under uh, what is called the pseudo gauge transformation. So you can, you can make a transformation, you can shift your spin current um, by, by some quantity, some, um, some three index um, tensor phi that is anti-symmetric in the, in the last two indices. And uh, re related to this, you can make a transformation of your energy momentum tensor similarly. And all the definition, so these equations will be conserved under these transformations. They are not going to change. They will keep their same form. And at the same time, the, angular the total angular momentum is not going to change. So that is, uh, that is, that is uh, but, so this gives essentially some ambiguity in the definition of the spin current. So you can always choose some phi to cancel this as completely. And that will be the Bellinfante rosenfeld choice. So the, there is an ambiguity. Uh, there is an ambiguity in the system, which is completely given by this uh, phi lambda, lambda mu nu. And what I will be first claiming in this talk, my, my, the first claim of this talk is that torsion, the concept of torsion removes this ambiguity completely. So let me um, describe this uh, to, to, to tell you uh, why this is so. Let me, um, let me first start with the, uh, Spin, the, the description of spin 
uh, in an effective action formalism. So let's assume that uh, there is a quantum field theory uh, in, in some non-trivial Lorentz representation and we integrate out the, the canonical degrees of freedom, say fermions or, or, or other spinful particles to obtain some, uh, some effective action. Okay, so this effective action will only be fu the functions of, uh, of the sources uh, that I will be choosing to be uh, the field bind and the spin connection. And then you can, you can define these quantities, T mu nu and S, S lambda AB, uh, the spin current and the energy momentum tensor by making variations with respect to these sources, to the, to the field bind and the spin connection. So if you do this, do it this way, then essentially you see exactly where this, uh, this particular form of, uh, of the ambiguity is coming from. That is essentially coming from the fact that in, in, in general relativity, the metric and the spin connection are not independent quantities. They are completely dependent quantities because they have to satisfy this constraint. When you take the uh, differential of an a, the, the field bind, so essentially this is, uh, this is the covariant derivative of the field bind with respect to the, um, the spin connection as the gauge field. If you take this uh, the covariant derivative, it has, it has to vanish because this covariant derivative is proportional to torsion. And what we have in our in our uh, in general relativity, typically a torsionless system. So you set torsion to zero. And if you use this constraint to to derive your energy momentum tensor, uh, you know this by by just taking variation of w with respect to e, modulo this constraint, you get exactly this form because the variations of uh, of the spin connection and the variations of the the field bind are connected to each other by they are locked to each other essentially by this equation. But this also tells you a, a way out. It tells you that the metric and the spin connection are going to be independent in the presence of torsion. So if I assume some torsion in the system, this torsion is going to be completely um, absorbing the ambiguity, if you like, uh, or the Bellin van der Rosenberg ambiguity, because the Bellin van der Rosenberg ambiguity is torsion. It's completely equivalent to torsion. So you can cancel this ambiguity completely by, by turning on a torsion source. So this is a, this is giving you a prescription. It doesn't give you. It doesn't tell you that uh, we have to be to be able to define uh, hydrodynamics with spin. We need to consider systems with torsion. It doesn't say that. It just tells you that torsion should be kept as a bookkeeping device in deriving your uh, hydrodynamic principle in, in deriving your hydro, hydrodynamic equations. And then at the end of the game, you can set the torsion to zero, exactly the way, uh, just analogous to to what we have been doing. In deriving hydrodynamics based on this action principle by 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 keeping the um, the external metric, right? so you define, for example, T mu with respect to that external metric. Yes. Umut, yes. Just to just to ask, I mean, this is something. If torsion existed, if you want, if the right. physical theory of gravity would be gravity with torsion, it would basically mean that pseudo gauge symmetry would be broken. That there would be a natural pseudo gauge. There would be a natural choice. Uh, yeah, there will be a natural gauge fixing. Okay, I see. Exactly. Thank you very, thank you very yeah. much. <clears throat> so what I what I propose here is let's assume that there is torsion, and then take the torsion going to zero limit at the end. So that that is essentially picking for you a particular uh, sort of sort of sort of gauge, um, sort of sort of gauge gauge. Right. So it's a particular gauge transform gauge choice. But it's the most natural gate choice because uh, this, uh, you know, it, it makes the, the description very, very simple. So, um, so to the upshot of this discussion so far is torsion is to the spin current as metric is to the stress tensor. So uh, let me repeat what I said before to derive the energy momentum tensor in this action formalism, we are using metric. Right? We, make, we define the energy momentum tensor with respect to, uh, by, by varying with respect to the metric. Here, you can define the spin current by varying with respect to torsion, if you want, because torsion and the spin connection become the same thing, especially in flat space. So let's keep torsion in the game as a bookkeeping device. Of course, I will be setting it to zero at the end. And um, um, in passing, I would like to note that uh, it's more practical to use a, a different concept, not torsion, but, uh, but contortion, what is called contortion. So torsion, torsion is essentially the antisymmetric part of the of the uh, uh, of the connection of the thing that we use in general relativity, the Levi-Civita connection. Um, so the Levi-Civita doesn't have antisymmetric part, but if you have an antisymmetric part of the of this uh, of a fine connection, then you have uh, you have that distortion. 
but contortion is completely equivalent to that. That is essentially uh, this component of the of the spin connection, which is apart from the one that you you obtain by uh, by assuming that this this equation is zero. So if you assume that this equation is zero, you can obtain you can solve this equation, and that would give you a torsionless spin connection that I will be denoting by this uh, spin connection with a with a ring on top. And there is Sorry. in the presence of torsion. May I ask you a question? Yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, we know that in the gravity, we have uh, freedom to choose uh, different bases for field bind, yes? Yes. Uh, and how do you deal with that freedom? Is this freedom? Yeah, so that will, that will essentially give you one of the equations in the system. That, that will be very important. So that, um, uh, so that local Lorentz transformations you are referring to, is going yes, to derive yes, yes. by using those local Lorentz transformations. You will be deriving. We will be deriving the spin connection, the spin equation of motion. Okay. So, so, so uh, if I understand correctly, the spin uh, conservation law is derived from the uh, freedom in the choice of field bind basis. Yes. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So to you. be to be so that's you should understand it this way because this is um, <clears throat> I mean this is not a dynamical theory, right? So this field bind and uh, and the spin connection are not dynamical fields; they are external sources, if you like. Mm -hmm. But uh, but to be able to couple your uh, your quantum field theory consistently to these external sources, you have to assume uh, this local Lorentz uh, invariance of the sources, mm -hmm. and local Lorentz invariance of the sources are going to so this this assumption this consistent coupling of your quantum field theory to external sources leads immediately leads to the uh, to the equation of motion for the spin degrees of freedom i will show this in a minute mm -hmm. thank you okay thank you very much for these very nice questions so they're you're always kind of guessing what is uh, what is ahead so but let me repeat what i said so i will be dealing mostly with uh, with contortion so the contortion is also has three indices two upper indices and so these two in upper indices are uh, anti symmetric a b and mu, mu is, um, uh, is the space-time index. And so this, as I said, this, um, this omega naught is the one that you obtain by, by solving the torsionless equation constraint that is just given in terms of the derivatives of E. So this equation is also telling you uh, something important that if you, in the end, of course, what we are going to do is we are going to send this, uh, this metric to flat metric, just, just as we do in, in the hydrodynamic description of, uh, of a spinless system. This is what you, you first assume that there is some non-trivial metric. And then at the end of the game, you just send the metric to zero, to, to one. So here we will do the same thing. So this, because this omega naught is given in terms of derivatives of the metric, this part is going to disappear. The only thing that you, will, that you are going to be left with in the absence of, in, in the flat space is the contortion. So the spin connection and the contortion become the same thing. So that's why contortion is, uh, is, is a more useful quantity than torsion itself, because this is precisely the, the, the conjugate variable to the spin connection, uh, sorry, to the spin, spin current. So eventually, of course, in quark Coulomb plasma, we want to send k to zero. And as I said, this is just a, this is a particular gauge fixing procedure that I'm following here. And at the end, we are going to send k to zero. So we will be dealing with the torsionless systems, but still you will have some non-trivial spin current from the order k terms, uh, I mean order linear terms in your in your um, effective action that are linear in k, because you define the the spin connection the spin current by taking variations with respect to these k terms. So even if we are going to send k to zero at the end, this is going to make a difference. So this particular choice of gauge is going to make a difference when you describe the spin current, because there will be terms that are linear in k. Right? So their, their their coefficients are going to appear in your spin current, and we will see the examples of those. But in passing, I just want to mention also that even we are going to send the torsion to the contortion to zero in the end, there are systems, especially in condensed matter, that uh, where distortion is playing a more central role. So for us, it's just a bookkeeping device, but that's an important bookkeeping device. But for, for certain condensed matter systems, these dislocations in the atomic structure are described precisely in the continuum limit, they are precisely described by, by this uh, by torsion. So let me give an example of this. So you consider, for example, this is the atomic structure um, of, uh, of, of graphene. So there are these two sublattices, A and B sublattices in the system given by the red and the 
and the yellow um, atoms. And you, you, you see, you, suppose that there is some kind of dislocation that you can, uh, you can, you can do, you can make by, uh, by in an experiment. Okay, so suppose that there is some kind of a dislocation like this, so that when you, when you, when, if you define the closure of a loop like this in these, uh, in these loops, here it doesn't close. So here there's a non-trivial Burgers vector that is positive, and here in this one there is a negative Burgers vector on the on the on the opposite direction. So this Burgers vector is assumed is is uh, denoted by this vector b here, and this is precisely torsion because torsion is defined by taking two different vectors, say in a square lattice, you take them to be per perpendicular to each other, and you parallel transport both of them with respect to the to the other to the other vector. Okay, so in the end. You do you look at this closure of this loop, and if this loop doesn't close, if there is some kind of a Burgers vector that describes this dislocation in your atomic structure, that is precisely the, the definition of torsion. That's proportional to the torsion tensor. And in a continuum limit, where you describe the system in an effective action in the infrared, uh, where the the atomic structure is not uh, seen anymore, but you, you are dealing with only infrared quantities, then torsion is going to be one of these dynamical variables. So there will be some field of um, Burgers vectors, or equivalently a field of torsion, which will be a part of your dynamical system. So that is uh, just um, uh, as, an, as a side note, I just want to make this uh, side note that uh, this, this description of hydrodynamics in the presence of torsion may also have some more fundamental applications in condensed matter systems. And um, a curious fact is that this, is, uh, this goes back to all the way to Kondo. And uh, in the 50s, Kondo was describing these dislocations by using torsion. So it's uh, amazing. And now it became uh, more and more interesting by after, um, uh, after graphene and bile semimetrics, et cetera. This can be used as some kind of uh, generation mechanism for spin transport in these systems as well. OK, so but let's, let's go back to the, um, um, to the formalism. <clears throat> so <clears throat> what we have now is uh, so completely, so I will be playing the, the same role, the, the same game as, uh, as this now. So I will be starting from an action principle, and then um, assuming that your our action that is a, a function of uh, the field bind and the spin connection are invariant under um, under under the symmetries, the fundamental symmetries of the system. So these fundamental symmetries, as usual, there is a diffeomorphism invariance, and there is a, there are these local Lorentz transformations. So I mentioned this already. So um, the diffeomorphism invariance is going to give you the first equation here. That will be the um, if you make a diffeomorphism transformation and assume that your your um, your sources are invariant under diffeomorphisms. So this equation is given by the killing uh, sorry the the lead derivative of your sources should be zero. If you just set your lead derivatives of your sources to be zero, you immediately get this equation. And then if you um, <clears throat> if you assume that there is a local Lorentz transformation where the field bind transforms like this and um, the, the spin connection transforms to the gauge field. Right? So this is exactly like a non-abelian gauge field. Then you get this equation automatically. So this is the systematics of uh, how, how the um, hydrodynamics of spin currents in the presence of, from the action principle works. You get these uh, equations. So let's uh, um, stop for a moment to, to, see, to, to see these equations, to, to, to understand these equations. So this equation is essentially the basic equation of hydrodynamics, the energy momentum conservation uh, in the presence of sources. So this is precisely analogous to that, that, uh, that term that we have seen before, F mu nu times J mu. Uh, in the presence of, um, so this is the, the Riemann curvature. In the presence of some curvature, the spin uh, is, is playing some role. So this is exactly analogous to that because this is, a, this is the, the spin current that is analogous to that charge current. This is the, um, this is the, the field strength of the, of the conjugate variable of the, of the source to that spin current, which is the field strength of A mu. So here, this is the field strength of, uh, of omega, the spin connection. And uh, there is an additional term that comes from the, the presence of contortion in this case. So this is energy momentum tensor. It, when we set the, the curvature to zero in the end, so this is going to disappear. When we set the contortion to zero in the end, this is going to disappear. So energy momentum tensor will be conjugate. And similarly, you see that uh, there is the second equation, the spin current equation. It is proportional to the antisymmetric part of, this, of the stress tensor. So the antisymmetric part of the stress tensor is sourcing spin current. In addition, there is another term that is proportional to contortion. So this will vanish when we set contortion to zero again. So these are the two equations that we would like to solve. 
Okay, I mean, these uh, don't worry, these equations are going to reappear many times during the talk. So um, <clears throat> I, I see, I know that they are, they look a bit complicated, but um, you will see them more. So here um, are these two equations again. And um, so there are four equations from the first one. This mu, new index is free. And there are six equations in this one because this uh, mu, mu, mu nu indices are free and mu nu is uh, anti-symmetric. In four dim, I will be always staying in four dimensions in this talk. So, but we see that just like in the case of uh, the charge uh, hydrodynamics, here we have 10 degrees of freedom, here we have 24 degrees of freedom. So we have uh, 24 degrees of freedom more. So this is an under constraint system. To solve this under constraint system, what we need is the, the constitutive relations, obviously. So we, we will be essentially deriving the constitutive relations that. Um, uh, that, um, that that give this t mu nu and s lambda mu nu in terms of these dynamical variables. So we have to first identify 10 dynamical variables in the system. So just like in the case of uh, charged fluid, we will be identifying the, um, the magnitude of this. So we are assuming that there is some um, hydrostatic um, description of the system. So there's some hydrostatic limit, which essentially tells you that there is a thermal equilibrium in the presence of sources. So if there is some thermal equilibrium in the presence of sources, thermal equilibrium means that there exists some killing vector, time-like killing vector that, uh, that I define, denote by Xi. And this, uh, then you can, by using this Xi, just the existence of Xi is enough to derive um, uh, the dynamical variables in the system. So the temperature will be inverse, uh, <clears throat> will be given by the magnitude of this, uh, of this killing vector. The fluid velocity will be, will be given by essentially the, the killing vector itself. Um, and then you can define what is called the spin chemical potential. Chemical is in, in quotes because uh, that there is no, nothing chemical about the spin potential, but this is just in the sense that this is completely analogous to uh, the electric um, chemical potential, mu E, which is which has exactly the same problem. In that case, you were contracting the, the time like killing vector with A mu, here you contract it with the spin connection. Okay, so these two, so, and you can see that because this satisfies U square equals minus one, this is, there's three degrees of freedom here. There's one degree of freedom and there are six degrees of freedom here. So this is 10 um, dynamical variables, which is exactly matches the number of equations which we can go ahead and solve. So the first problem that we have to address now is how to express this T mu nu and S lambda mu nu, this energy momentum tensor and the spin current in terms of these dynamical variables. So, um, <clears throat> and in this talk, what I will be doing is uh, I will be assuming that uh, the, the contortion is the first order in derivatives, okay? And if you assume that the contortion is first order in derivatives, you automatically um, see from these equations, you can see immediately that the, the spin, the spin uh, current is going to be first order in derivatives and the, the stress, the anti-symmetric part of the energy momentum tensor will be second order in derivatives. So in this talk, I will be deriving these constitutive relations up to these orders, starting from this assumption that uh, the contortion uh, this external source in your in your system is is proportional is is first order in derivatives. There's a very natural choice, but uh, but there are other choices that can be made. Okay, so <clears throat> let's uh, look at let's consider now uh, the hydrostatic equilibrium. So let's assume um, that there is some hydrostatic equilibrium described by this um, killing time like killing vector psi, and demand that the sources are Invariant under uh, under this this um, this psi time so by the lead derivatives of these uh, sources vanish. So this is the this is essentially the uh, the mathematical description of uh, the hydrodynamic uh, so the hydrostatic equilibrium. If you do this, you immediately get um, just so here I'm not assuming anything, right? So this is very general. So we just assume that there is some kind of uh, effective action that is expressed completely in terms of these, these two, field bind and the spin connection. And then you assume that there is hydrostatic equilibrium, you immediately get a, a, an non-trivial equation that relates the spin chemical potential to the, to the external sources and um, derivatives of the, of the fluid velocity. So you get this equation. This equation tells you that mu AB, the spin chemical potentials are proportional to the torsion, the time component of the torsion, plus there's an acceleration term so this is a, this a, a is an acceleration. There is a anti-symmetric uh, combination of the, the fluid velocity with the acceleration. So acceleration is defined by, by the derivative, uh, by the lead derivative of, of the fluid velocity along the fluid velocity. 
And there is, a, there is an additional term that comes from vorticity. So what you can, uh, so if you, if you are familiar with the earlier works, I mean, the, the one of the reasons that I, I put this equation in a box is uh, for, for some of the people in the audience, I think they are familiar with the earlier works in, um, in, in hydrodynamics with the spin current. And this is precisely making connection with those earlier works. Here you see that uh, these two combination, if you combine these two, you will get what, uh, what, have, what people have been calling thermal vorticity. And in the absence of torsion, we see that the spin chemical potential are exactly the thermal vorticity. So this is a, and there's an additional equation which, which gives acceleration in terms of um, gradients of temperature. But this is, a, this, is a, this is some, you know, very precise connection with the earlier work. Well, more, ju ju yes. just to ask, <coughs> commutation relations kind of play no role here, right? Commutation relations, you mean? Play no role here. Uh, well, there is nothing. What do you mean by the commutation? You mean like quantum, me quantum mechanical commutation relations? Yeah. Um, I'm not. I'm not using any of any of those. So here, this is. Um, so the the only thing that uh, that to 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 derive these these equations, the only thing that you need essentially is just um, demanding that the lead derivatives of these external sources are zero. So you start with some arbitrary potential. Of uh, a functional of e and uh, and w and omega, sorry, and but, and you assume these two. That's all. But this mu a b is decomposable in in an algebra, right? It is decomposable in an algebra. I will be doing that. I see. Uh, I be, yeah, I will come to that now. I will okay, come. thank you. But yeah. Okay, but this is the this is so far everything is classical. So. Um, Maybe there is an addition. Maybe, maybe there is an alternative description of this using commutation relations, and um, maybe Poisson, Poisson um, um, commutations. But yeah, I don't. I don't really. I'm not using those at all here. So, but this is telling you. This equation is telling you uh, three things. First of all, it's telling you that the spin potential, what we have been calling the spin potential, though, so these variables mu a b, are exactly equivalent to thermal vorticity these two, the combination of these two, two objects uh, in the absence of torsion at equilibrium. But this is, this is important because outside the equilibrium, this mu a b has, has its own life. It becomes the thermal vorticity only at equilibrium. So hydrodynamics doesn't necessarily be describing thermal equilibrium. It can be completely far away from thermal equilibrium and you can still describe your system by using hydrodynamics. And this is what we have been seeing in all these attractor mechanisms and, and so on. So hydro, hydrodynamics is much more general than hydrostatics. So this is telling you that essentially this mu AB is, uh, is, is the right degrees of freedom to solve the hydrodynamic uh, equations of motion, which at the same time become this, uh, what, what people have been calling thermal vorticity in the, in the equilibrium limit. So um, another thing that you see, so this, what I said is uh, the first one and the third one. And what you also see is that the torsion and thermal vorticity are sourcing uh, spin connection. So this essentially opens a, a, a new understanding or, or a new way to understand this uh, transport, spin transport in these systems. Because once you have spin chemical potential, you automatically get spin density. So you may be, for example, trying to, um, you, you can try to generate spin density in some system, say a condensed matter system or so, by using thermal thermal gradients, by using this equation that uh, this uh, you know this a mu is proportional thermal gradients near an equilibrium, that would uh, effectively generate some spin density in your system. And you can ask this question. You can go ahead in, in a lab. You can see if this is uh, this is realizable or not. But uh, and also the same thing for the torsion. So this tells you, for example, that these uh, these dislocations in your system, which can be described by torsion, are going to generate spin density. Okay, so, um, so that's one of the key, uh, key equations in this talk. So then, uh, then we come to this, the question that I've been asking in the previous slide. Still, we have to somehow determine um, these, uh, these dynamical variables, mu a, b, and u, u, a, and temperature. So there are these 10 degrees of freedom that we have to solve. We have to obtain by solving the, um, the hydro, hydrodynamic, hydrodynamics equations. So for that, we need, uh, we need constitutive relations. So let's come back to what um, uh, Giorgio was asking. Um, first, to 
that will become clear, I think, well, now um, by, by these constitutive relations, are, this is what I'm going to be deriving next. Uh, we will see how, how this works. So what we want to do is we want to construct a hydrodynamic action um, out of these, these variables. So these are dynamical variables, this temperature, uh, fluid velocity, field bind, and the contortion, and their derivatives. So that is, uh, that is essentially what we are going to do. And um, to, to do this, the best thing that you can do the easiest way to go ahead is to first decompose your spin connection into two parts. So you start with your spin connection. You take the time component of your spin connection. So this is this has a new hidden mu index here. So if you contract this with, uh, with your fluid velocity u mu, you get the spin potential. And then the rest is going to be the spatial torsion. So this is the time lag torsion if you want, and this is the spatial torsion. And um, what you can further do is you take, so this is, this is going to be the important uh, for us. So this spatial torsion is the analogous of those uh, dislocations in, in condensed matter systems that you can ignore and you can set them to zero if you want from, from now on. But the important role is going to be played by the spin potential. So because the spin potential is, is going to be the dynamical degree of freedom. So what you can further do is that you can decompose your spin potential Again, um, by using the presence of, uh, of a u, u mu, this fluid velocity. So there will be two different parts. And you can think of this as some kind of, as, uh, so this is an anti-symmetric object. So you can think of decomposing your field strength for in QED or in electrodynamics in term, into uh, electric field and a magnetic field. So this, this m, little m, is playing the role of an electric field. There's three degrees of freedom here, just like in the case of electric field. And here there is another two, three degrees of freedom. This is, a, if you want, something like a magnetic, spin magnetic and spin electric field, if you like. Okay, so those two are going to be the main um, variables. Three plus three, there is a six degrees of freedom. And then the question is, um, how do we write down the hydrodynamic action? So once you have this decomposition, then you can go ahead and write down the most general hydrodynamic action. And of course, since these two are our only degrees of freedom, in addition to temperature. So those are the only scalars. The only kind of scalars that you can construct are uh, m square, m tilde square, and m dot m tilde. Those are the only things that you can construct. So it's just like a e square, b square, and e dot b. And of course, temperature. So this, uh, the, you then just write down the most general function of, uh, of these variables. And that is going to be the, uh, the pressure uh, of, of the system. So that is the, if you like, in the absence of these um, derivative corrections, the system that we are describing can be called an ideal fluid. So this will be ideal fluid with spin. And this will be this, uh, the first term, the zeroth order term in the derivative expansion uh, in your effective action are, is, is going to be the ideal uh, fluid pressure. And then we have to write down all these uh, gradient corrections to those. So let me again pause uh, for a moment. Uh, to see if there are any questions. I, I hope I didn't lose you already. Uh, is there any questions? I have, I have a naive question, which probably is because of my misunderstanding, but or lack of understanding. But you talk uh, a lot about uh, the fact that at the at the end of your let's say formulation, you just put the torsion to zero, right? Yeah. Uh, so this is just a tool of getting the equations. But now I can ask Anna the question whether if you have the torsion, whether this doesn't, how this can impose some in ambiguity in the formalism. Because you don't know if the torsion is there, right? Well, we know that in quark Coulomb plasma, the space how? there is no space-time torsion, right? How do you know? Well, this is space-time torsion. Space-time, we know that in, in um, I mean, there may be extremely small torsion that I would never know that would be generated from quantum gravity or something, but that would have, have absolutely no effect. So, okay. so this is space-time torsion. If if you so you can you, yeah. Okay, so this is just okay. So. So you see the, the let me let me okay so this is a good question because I think um, torsion is some some kind of quantity that we are not really familiar with we are not using in in, in our in particle physics mostly 
essentially because it, it, uh, it's not observed in nature. So, but except in these, um, in these effective description of these you know, atomic structures in quantum mass matter systems, these dislocations are precisely described effectively by this uh, distortion. But apart yeah, from- I'm, I'm raising this question because this is something which, you know, this uh, debate is, uh, is back to, I don't know, like 60s or something like this whether the torsion can be really there or not. And there are words by Kyle and uh, other people. Yeah. And, and I think uh, you can go over all this literature at, and at the very end, you ask yourself a question, okay, but do you know if the torsion is there or not? And then, uh, and then everything is just bound to this question. But I yeah. understand yeah. that here it's, it's kind of, you don't expect it, right? To... No, I don't expect it in quarkulum plasma in space time. I don't, even if there is torsion, it should be so small that we haven't been observing any effects of that. So, okay. in, in, then if you like, uh, in uh, particular, if you look at this equation here, there is vorticity and there is torsion side by side, and the vorticity is uh, can be measured, and this is going to be much, much, much more bigger than some uh, space time torsion, even if it is there. I mean. I don't know if, of course, if you ask me if there is space-time torsion or not, to me, there is no space-time torsion. I will be setting it to zero. But, uh, but your question, I mean, even if it is there, I think this formalism has, uh, has room for it, as you have seen. Uh, for example, it will be con contributing to the generation of the spin current because it, it is a part of the, the spin chemical yeah. potential. Okay. So, so in, the, in the end, if you, if you, if you say that, uh, well, we discovered that there is a space-time torsion, or you consider, for example, a graphene with dislocations, and you want to understand the, how uh, spin currents are generated there, then yes, okay, so you can, you can keep this there. Mm -hmm. You can even keep this uh, as zeroth order. I will, I will assume that this is, this is first order in derivatives, but this is an assumption. So you can always choose it to be zeroth order as well, the spatial torsion. Okay. Yeah, so that's also a part of the, the formalism. Uh, sorry. Uh, in line with questions from Radek and the comment that Georgia made in the early times of your talk, uh, if torsion exists, so there's no segregation transformation freedom, yeah? Yes. That's right, yeah. It fixes, if you want, torsion just like keeping torsion as an external source, it, it, it fixes the ambiguity completely. You can always absorb that uh, ambiguity in the Bellinfante Rosenfeld transformations into the definition of your torsion. Um, may I ask you a question? This is Igor. Um, hi, Igor. Hi. I, I just, I'm a little bit confused. Uh, I, I understand that torsion here plays a very, very nice role of sort of ordering things and keeping uh, conventions straight, but. In the end, we know that it's absent, as you are emphasizing so many times. So in right. a way, it's just a matter of choosing a specific that's pseudo right. page. That's right. That's so right. what's the big picture? Why, why is this well, beneficial? The benef yeah, uh, the, the, the reason that it's beneficial is because essentially this is very suitable for this action formalism. I mean, if you're doing hydrodynamics with a, with a different formalism by essentially, for example, the entropy current, by writing down the entropy, most general entropy current and de de demanding that it is uh, you know, positive definite and whatever. So that there are different ways of approaching hydrodynamics, but in this particular way of doing it in terms of um, an action formalism and these external sources in your action formalism, torsion is, is, uh, is, is filling the gap of uh, you know, fixing this ambiguity completely. But it's so still it's, just a convention. You it may is, have it a different a formulation. Right, this is a convention, but it is nice. So there are two, two answers to your question. Well, there are many, but one thing that it is, I, I like torsion in the sense that um, even if you are setting this to, so it allows me to organize the, um, um, the, the formalism in a, in a very clear way, as you already mentioned. And then uh, for example, there will be, so this is the, the comment that I was making here, that uh, once you accept to, to organize your, uh, your hydrodynamic principle uh, by using, by fixing this ambiguity by, by torsion, um, even if we are setting this to zero at the end, uh, there will be some non-trivial component of the spin current that will be coming from this linear terms in your effective action. So that, that is something that you know. 
But you can always ask the following question that, okay, so these linear terms could be there indeed, but uh, in a different kind of formalism where I don't have any torsion in my, in my description, I describe the spin current in a completely different way, uh, these linear terms should also be present. It is true. And indeed, there is, a, there is such a formalism. Actually, that, uh, there was this, uh, that's that uh, paper of Misha. I don't know if you're familiar with uh, that paper. Ho Which Ing Misha? Ho uh, Stefano. Misha oh, okay. Stefano and Ho Ying um, and, and someone else, I forgot. They had, uh, they had a very nice paper. So they've been uh, describing this uh, spin hydrodynamics by mapping the system to, to, some, uh, to, to a completely different system with, uh, with the charged fluids. And then, uh, so you should be getting all these uh, linear order terms in your effective action by using a completely different prescription, but it is very easy to make mistakes there. That's, that's, I think that's what Misha would also agree with. So, uh, so for me, this is just a formalism. So this is one of the answers. So the, the other answer is, um, is the following, that, uh, that it is precisely this thing that I was saying. So suppose, I mean, you, you, are, you are one of the guys that, you, that, that like graphene, right? So, <laughs> so you, want to, you want to do some uh, hydrodynamics with spin based on graphene with these locations. So I just tell you that this is perfect uh, degrees of freedom. This is the perfect uh, mathematical description of these locations are going to be in terms of this torsion. So there it plays an important role. And sort of on the technical side, there, there was this assumption that K was linear in derivatives, I believe you said. I suspect that if you take different assumptions, there will be different physics implications. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Just like, just, just like in um, 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 insulators and conductors, <laughs> right? So in the case of an insulator, for example, the, the gauge fields, the, the electric fields, uh, in the case of a conductor, the electric field is uh, given by the gradient of uh, chemical potential. So that's first order. But in the case of an insulator, that's zeroth order. So depending on the system that you are dealing with, when you construct the hydrodynamic formalism, you, this is a, you choose this order in derivatives depending on the, on the system. So here, oh. for example, mm -hmm. here that, that would be in this particular system, those torsions are not going to go away when you, when you set the derivatives to zero. So these will be given by the dislocations. They are not going to dissolve, relax into uh, nothing. So they will be there. So that in that case, I will be treating torsion as a zero order in derivatives. Okay. Um, can I just make uh, can I uh, can I just make a comment about this about the ambiguity? Yeah. Um, I mean. The pseudo gauge transformation is kind of a consequence of local Lorentz invariance, unless you, I mean, unless torsion is physical, in my opinion. And uh, I, in ideal fluid dynamics, this local Lorentz invariance is further constrained. Like you say, you have a, um, you have a killing vector, and in this killing vector, the entropy, uh, however you define it, is maximum, and um, the state there is the um, uh, and the uh, and the state has this what do you call it the Wigner uh, uh, it's the Wigner periodic I mean, it has yeah. this periodic it has this periodic boundary condition right. um, physically I mean you mentioned something about you mentioned something about attractors you mentioned something about attractors but physically the only um, expansion where this sort of ambiguity, in my opinion, can sort of be removed systematically with something physical is this one. It's local thermalization. And then the spin current and the vorticity current are separated because of entropy maximization. Entropy, you have a local maximization of microstates and mm -hmm. um, some become the spin and some become the collective motion of vorticity. Um, more generally, I think there is, there is no such thing. And this is my issue with, with this kind of ambiguity. I mean, yeah, sorry, that was the, the that was my comment. <laughs> okay. So, uh, I think, I mean, let me, let me go ahead and let me finish the talk. So, and that I would really like to discuss, uh, discuss this with you, because that's something that I, I never understood, uh, from this email exchange that we had. Sure. Uh, that's one of the things that I, I, I didn't understand. But let me make my, I may be misunderstanding your comment, but uh, for me, the um, hydrostatics is not playing an extremely important role. That I would like to say that if we can describe the 
some kind of coherent motion of spin degrees of freedom in a system, this is an assumption, then that can be present far away from equilibrium. And if it is, if it is, uh, if the system is far from equilibrium, then it will be described by these uh, what I was calling spin potentials. So, and at equilibrium, these spin potentials are indeed uh, can be decomposed into torsion and uh, and the and the and the vorticity, just like in this equation. But apart, if away from uh, away from the equilibrium, that these guys have their own lives. So, but I mean, I didn't say anything about entropy maximization, obviously. But let, let's discuss that later. Um, because I will say something later about entropy. Maybe, maybe that will answer your question. So let's uh, bear with me. Okay, well, thank you very much for the questions. Um, and so let me go ahead. Um, so we were here. Uh, so essentially what, uh, so I will be going a bit faster from now on because I think uh, we established the basics. So the 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 game the rule the, the the game now is to construct the most general scalar out of these uh, these these variables. So there's m square, m tilde square, m dot m tilde, and temperature and their gra and their gradients. So for the ideal, let's let's look at the ideal spin fluid first. So ignoring all the uh, the gradient corrections, we will be focusing on the zero order term. That is just the this pressure term. There's no dissipation in the system. And then you can write down just from the fact that your, your action can be written, uh, should be a function of these, uh, these objects, that just from this, you can take variations with respect to the field bind and the spin connection to derive the constitutive relations. So the constitutive relations, so the nice thing, maybe uh, in connection to what Igor was asking, the nice thing about this action formalism is that uh, it, it gives you the constitutive relations immediately. Starting from this pressure term, you just take the variations with respect to the sources, and then you get these two equations. So here, this is the equation that we are all familiar with. So this is the constitutive relation for the energy momentum tensor in terms of energy density and the pressure density. So this is just the, the projector uh, perpendicular to the fluid velocity. And in the presence of some spin chemical potentials, you have a, you have a second term. You have this additional term, which you can understand as, uh, so this, this term only has some uh, spatial uh, uh, direction. So this you can understand just something like a, um, a spin pointing vector because this M was like an electric, uh, like an electric field, uh, electric spin electric field. This was like a spin magnetic field. And this, this is exactly like uh, M, M cross M tilde. That's like a spin pointing vector, which contributes to the momentum of the system. So, and then there's a coefficient of this momentum which is given by these, uh, these derivatives of the, of the pressure with respect to m square and m tilde, uh, capital M square. Um, that is, this capital M is, this, is the, the Poincare duals of this uh, capital m tilde vector. And this little m tilde with two indices is the Poincare dual of this m tilde. So it's just notation. But, uh, but you see that this is, a, this is this precise term that you can derive with, with the coefficient and everything that, that comes automatically. And, um, on top of this, so the, the spin density, what you get for the ideal fluid is that the spin uh, current is given in terms of a spin density. So this is just like analogous to uh, charge current given, in given as uh, u, u mu times, uh, times the charge density rho. This is just the spin density times u lambda. So this is, um, the, and there's no other, uh, other terms. It's all proportional to u, u lambda. And on top of this, you can derive this uh, gibbs duhem uh, do have right, like relations directly by again by taking variations with respect to the field binds and the, and the spin connection that you get for example the energy is given by by this the only thing so this is like the um, the first law except that you have you have uh, sort of the this gibbs Duham relation except that you have a new term that is proportional to mu times rho and the rho itself can be decomposed like uh, like this i'm not going to get into details of that but this is all given in terms of uh, um, susceptibilities. So this is the second uh, important uh, equation that I would be, uh, that's why I took it into, into a box. Okay, so let's now go ahead and uh, look at the first. So this is zero order if you want. So this is ideal spin fluid. Now, um, so this is already solving the, the equations of motion. So what, what you have been here is that, you know, you, the energy, so this is what I promised that we had to reduce this uh, number of degrees of freedom from, from 10 to four uh, and 24 to six. And this is what I, what I have done. So by these constitutive relations that automatically come from, uh, 
the fact that there is some kind of an action. Uh, okay, so but you can go ahead. So um, you can you can derive first order hydrostatics, and uh, go ahead and you can look at uh, first order and second order hydrodynamics. This is what I will be doing, but um, it becomes extremely messy. So even at the level of ideal spin fluid, you see how messy it is because of these additional degrees of freedom, this M and uh, M tilde, you can, you can construct many different terms. That's why it becomes, uh, it, it becomes messy. Even if in addition to those terms that you can obtain from, uh, from an action principle that can also include these gradient corrections, there, there may be some additional terms that cannot come from an action principle because action is assuming that there exists some kind of killing vector. So for example, dissipation, you cannot obtain from action. You have to use, like, you can obtain from action, but you have to do a schwinger kaldish formalism, etc. So it will be all uh, extremely complicated um, to, to go ahead and derive the first order and second order um, spin uh, hydrodynamics. So that's why we make an assumption. Uh, we are only assuming a conformal a conformally invariant fluid and the parity invariant. So we, we make these two assumptions. So that kills many of those terms. In particular, it, uh, it, uh, so just the, the fact that there is a conformal invariance in the system, uh, which you can implement in the action formalism by assuming the while invariance of your action. Okay, so by, uh, this is the while transformation. If you assume that your, while, your field bind uh, with respect to this transformation, your action is invariant under this, and you immediately get the conformal world identity for the spin fluid, which relates the, um, the trace of the energy momentum tensor to the, uh, to the gradient of, uh, of the spin, uh, spin, spin, chart, spin current. Okay, so this is the generalization of T mu mu equals zero in the absence of uh, S. And uh, one nice thing about this uh, assumption of conformality and parity invariance is that uh, it, it kills all these terms. So there is no little m anymore. The only object that you can construct is this, uh, is this uh, small m tilde, so the, or this capital M. So all the other degrees of freedom die. So it restricts completely the, um, the number of terms that you can write down. And if you do this, you get, uh, you get this nice, nice relation. So you get a conformally invariant fluid. So this is all, we are familiar with, so assume for, for a moment that M, capital M is zero, this spin chemical potential is zero, then you get precisely the conformal fluid um, uh, equation of state, that uh, pressure is uh, one third of the energy, and this is not there anymore, etc. But if you now turn on this uh, capital M, this spin chemical potential, you get corrections to this. E equals P divided by three, uh, is, sorry, P equals E divided by three is still valid, as you can see, this there is a factor of three here. Uh, but also, in addition, you get this uh, spin density is proportional to the spin chemical potential with this precise number. Okay, so this is a conformal fluid. Now, assuming conformality, you can go ahead and uh, construct the, uh, the most general um, derivative correction uh, that comes from this torsion, this uh, linear in torsion terms. This is the terms that I was, uh, I've been referring to uh, many times that you can construct these terms uh, by just writing down the most general object. So this is not that straightforward. I mean, there's a lot of computations going in um, that I'm skipping, but this is essentially the upshot of that computation that you, there are only three different types of terms that you can write down, obtained by uh, different combinations of, uh, of torsion. And then uh, this is one. So by starting with this, uh, this additional term, so this uh, first order and derivative term, you can go ahead and obtain now the spin current. Of course, there is an equation also for the energy momentum tensor. I'm not even showing that. For the spin current, you get all these three different corrections to the, to the ideal spin current. So these are the corrections that I was, I, was, I, was, I was telling you. For example, here, this is a term that is linear in torsion. So you make a variation with respect to the spin connection, which becomes torsion in the, in the um, flat limit. <clears throat> and then this term gives you that contribution to the spin current. Which doesn't, which doesn't go away if you set k to zero in the end, right? So this is coming from this linear term. So that, that's, that's some term that is, that is just there. It's not even dependent on the, the chemical, spin chemical potentials. So these two, two other terms are proportional to the spin chemical potential, but there is this additional term that is not. Okay, so it's like, a, if you want some unsourced universal component. Um, okay, so let's go ahead. And so this was so far, everything was equilibrium, so near, near equilibrium, right? So I, I assume that there is some hydrostatic description and I was assuming that everything can be derived from the action. A anything that can be derived from the action 
is, uh, is near equilibrium. If you want. But now we can go ahead and write down um, the non-equilibrium corrections. But those, those you cannot do by using the action formalism. Those you have to derive essentially by, uh, by, by hand. You have to write down the most general terms that, uh, that has the same um, symmetry structure as the spin current. And those terms are to be these, uh, these, these additional terms. So let me just go, go through, through these terms one by one. This is uh, the shear tensor. This is a dissipative correction to the spin current that comes from the shear tensor. So this is shear induced spin current proportional to some, some transport coefficient that I'm calling sigma one. There are additional terms, um, for example, so there are in, in, the, in the absence, in, in, in the equilibrium, those combinations vanish because in precisely in equilibrium, as we have seen before, this, uh, this equation in the box, in the absence of torsion, you can decompose this into M, little m and uh, M tilde, and those will match completely these, uh, this decomposition. So M will be proportional to A, capital M tilde will be proportional to, uh, will be, will be uh, given by, uh, by the vorticity. So these particular combinations vanish completely in the, it, at thermal equilibrium. But if you are away from thermal equilibrium, these combinations are there, are present, and those have to be uh, playing, an, they, they have to contribute to the spin current. Okay, so that's why those contributions are there. Now, um, uh, go ahead. One of these terms look like uh, the ohm current, yeah? Which one? Mm, the one which small m. Right here. Small m, but the one that is transverse. This one. Yeah. And the other one looks like the polarization. Uh, you mean like this one? Yeah, I don't. I don't really have a very, very deep physical understanding of these terms at the moment. I mean, maybe yeah, it's, it may be a good comment indeed. So the only thing I would, I mean, I have to. Um, so you have to, you have to be uh, cautious. A, a little bit, uh, a, a word of caution here that these are not exactly spin chemical mm -hmm. potentials. So they are combinations of this word with vorticity and acceleration. Thank you. But indeed, yeah, so maybe there is uh, some interpretation like that is possible. This is a gradient expansion, right? Right, exactly. Yeah. Um, okay. So these are the same, same ordering gradients due to my assumption that spin chemical, pot so the spin chemical potentials are first order. Just as a sort of word of, in my opinion, word of warning, I mean, the dimensionful parameter of length that goes with the gradient here is not necessarily the Knudsen number because you don't have a mean free path here. Some of these things are non dissipative They also apply to equilibrium, right? Um, these terms here, I think they are all dissipative. They're all dissipative. Yeah, they're all dissipative. But I mean, if you take this fluid, I mean, you put it in a box, you shake it, and then you wait an infinite amount of time, some of the angular momentum that you generated by shaking will become polarization, right? That's right, yeah. Yeah. That's um, right. And this is exactly, this is exactly what, um, what this is saying, I think. This OK, is, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, OK. Those two, exactly, yeah. Yeah. But then some of these terms will be known. Ah, okay. So these are the equilibrium. These are the non- Exactly. These are the equilibrium ones. Indeed. So okay, they, are in, sorry. They, they are included. Right. I misunderstood. Thank you. Right, right. They're included in the game. So those are the terms that I, uh, I mentioned already. So this first order terms and the zero order terms, the ideal ones. But those, the last, the last ones I'm talking, so this is the variation of S, right? So this is not, the, sorry. I mean, this is the correction to the S coming from the dissipative contribution. So these are all dissipative. Okay, thanks for the question. And, um, but then, okay, so we see, for example, in this conformally invariant and parity invariant fluid, we have these NIV, um, five NIV transport coefficients. There are many more also uh, for the energy momentum tensor. I'm not even giving the expression for the energy momentum tensor. It's very complicated. And how to fix those transport coefficients. So one, one way to fix those, I mean, at least to constrain those transport coefficients is demanding that the, the, the entropy current 
uh, is positive definite. So the entropy production is positive definite. The variation, the, um, the gradient of the entropy current is positive definite. And uh, you can, you also have on-cycle relations, of course. So that's uh, coming from the reciprocity. Um, so I, I will come to that later. For the moment, let me just, uh, I just wanted to flash these, um, these, uh, these equations, the, the precise form of the equations for a conformal uh, spin hydro. That is essentially, now these are coming from the fact, so these are just derived completely from, uh, from these equations. These two equations, you take these two equations and make a uh, substitute that constitutive expansions, the constitutive relations for the spin current and the energy momentum tensor inside this. And then you get immediately those um, directly the equations for uh, the, so these variables that the shear tensor, the, the spin chemical potential M component, the capital M component, et cetera. There are these four equations that one can in principle uh, go ahead and solve. So to be able to solve these, uh, these four uh, coupled system of equations, you need, to need, you need to know two things. First, this, uh, this transport coefficients. Of course, we don't know these transport coefficients, so we cannot solve them yet. And you need the initial conditions. Okay, so this initial condition of quark Coulomb plasma, for example, is, is always uh, an issue. Sorry, one question. Is this causal? Uh, uh, well, this is, this is yeah, yeah, you have to, you may have to include, so this as it stands, it is, so if I treat this, uh, these terms independently, yes, it is causal, I think, yes. But there may be, I mean, I, you see, so we will see, you may have to include the second order corrections, just like in the case of uh, Israel Miller's Stewart theory. So there will be some, some analog of uh, uh, Miller Israel Stewart theory by including, by treating this, um, these so additional corrections as independent degrees of freedom. So in order probably to go to the causal theory, we, you have to do some similar treat. Yeah, 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 yeah. Probably you have to do it, but uh, if you assume for the moment, indeed, so, I mean, we are not solving any numerical uh, system of equations here. If you yeah, want to apply this- uh, I mean, because I asked, because you are saying that this is something that you can solve. And, uh, yeah, yeah, you can solve, yeah, no, no, I, yeah. Okay. In principle, you can solve it exactly. So before solving it in in, um, in in practice, I think you need to you need to massage them a bit. Yeah, because I, I think this will be on causal. You will uh, probably so that that you can easily check by by essentially making a, a linear fluctuation and uh, solve this uh, linear system of equations and see if there is some kind of um, uh, instability. Sorry, um, no, but in this, equation, in this particular equation, sigma is just uh, one, first order in derivatives, right? Uh, sigma is first order in derivatives. That's oh. given, that's the shear tensor, yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. So this is a second order part on the, on the left hand side. This is a second order equation. But you are, you are probably right. So I'm, I'm going to be all um, skipping that and uh, essentially um, um, bypassing those problems by, by finding an analytic solution by further assumptions, as you will see now. But this is just a general comment that if you want to solve these equations, you need to fix this transport coefficient by some means, I don't know how, uh, by kinetic theory or by holography, whatever. And then you have to specify the initial conditions. Okay, then in principle, these are going to determine uh, those, those variables for you, as how, how they evolve in time. Okay, so now let's apply, I mean, it's been already, uh, I'm, I'm almost uh, at the end of the talk. So let me, let me turn on the light. And uh, let me just um, sketch an application to the heavy ion collisions. So, uh, in, in, so Masood, it's going to take only five minutes. Is that okay? Or uh, should, I, should I just show the, the final oh. answer? Okay, thank you. So, um, <clears throat> so now let's let's go ahead and apply this uh, formalism to to heavy ion collisions. Now, in in the heavy ion collisions, so I'm just uh, so this is the picture that I've shown already. So the the general law is that uh, in an off-central collision, there is a, there are, there are these velocity gradients, and from these velocity gradients, you you produce some kind of uh, thermal vorticity, and the thermal vorticity. Uh, because of the spin orbit coupling is going to orient the, the spin so in the particles and that's going to be a global polarization. So my take here is that this is true, 
but it's only true assuming that this is a, this process is taking place in a, in a hydrostatic equilibrium. And um, in more general, if this is not taking place in hydrostatic equilibrium, in for example, in um, in the in an expanding fluid that is not necessarily close to equilibrium, everything is. Uh, but still, everything can be described by hydrodynamics. Then instead of thermal vorticity, you have to be using the spin chemical potentials as dynamical degrees of freedom. And then you have to be solving this set of equations. And this is what I'm going to do. I will solve these equations and I will bypass that, uh, that problem that uh, Radoslav mentioned about uh, causality, et cetera, by essentially, um, you will see how, by, by, by finding an analytic solution. So from this, what we can do is uh, then we can calculate. So from the spin chemical potentials, we can then, you can write down a formula that, uh, uh, you know, one of the, the people who derived it was, uh, was, uh, was Radoslav and Florkowski et al. And there was a paper by Bekatini et al. So they essentially more or less saying the same thing that the spin polariz the polarization of an identified particle in the quark, in the heavy ion collisions like lambda hyperons or whatever can be given by using, uh, um, the, um, <clears throat> the pauli willers vector, essentially, you can, be, you, can, you can express this quantity, this average polarization by, uh, as an integral over the freeze out surface. So this is the, uh, the area element of the freeze out surface contracted with the momentum. Um, I'm assuming some massive particle like lambda hyperon. And, and inside this um, integrant of this quantity, there is some uh, Boltzmann type distribution. You can take this to be the Boltzmann distribution e to minus you know, beta t or whatever. And then con contracted with the spin chemical potential. So this equation is directly coming from the, the, the original defi definition of the Pauli Willer vector. Um, sorry, uh, Pauli Lubansky, I'm sorry, Pauli Lubansky vector. Okay. So, uh, and then, so this is a kind of essential, if you, if you assume that this equation is correct, then um, by solving the spin hydrodynamic equations of motion, we will determine this mu. And from this mu, we will determine the spin potential. So from the spin potential, we will determine the, uh, the average polarization. So let's see what we, uh, how, how we can do this. So I will be uh, taking an additional assumption that um, assuming that we have a nearly flat repetitive distribution, so that, uh, that is essentially the Bjorken flow. Uh, that means that essentially U, T, the spin chemical potentials are all independent of, uh, of rapidity. And the full symmetry of the Bjorken flow is going to be this boost invariance times the translation invariance uh, transverse to the, um, to the expansion direction times the Z2 that is uh, mapping eta to minus eta, right? So this is um, so, so the Z axis to the minus Z axis. So this is the expansion direction. These are the transverse directions. And I'm assuming the boost invariance along this uh, Z direction. If you assume this, then you immediately get uh, a solution. The solution is U tau equals one. This is the Bjorken flow. And uh, um, the temperature, for example, is, uh, is going to be decreasing as a function of this uh, proper time, uh, like one third plus some um, shear uh, viscosity correction that goes like one over tau. And a a E naught is just the energy density, the initial energy density. Okay, so, but of course, in this case, there is no <clears throat> global spin polarization you will obtain because, because of the symmetry of the problem. You don't have these gradient vectors in this flow. So there's, it's just all completely, you know, the, all these um, velocity gradients are, are the same in both directions. If you want to, what you have to do is you have to break this uh, translational symmetry. To break the translational symmetry, you can choose an initial condition. You can assume that there is a correction, a fluctuation to the eta component, the repetitive component of your fluid velocity that is proportional to the impact parameter B and some um, linear in momentum in the, in the X direction. So this is exactly mimicking uh, this kind of initial condition. So here, this is a, like, this is the QX is going to give you this uh, change in the gradients of these vectors. And B is uh, the, proper, the fact that it's proportional to B is telling you that this is only uh, present in the, when, when you have considered some off central collision. So this is the initial condition. And once you have this um, addition, so this, this correction to the, on top of your Bjorken flow, then you can go ahead and uh, insert this, uh, this uh, into these, these equations and you can solve these equations. And here is the result, what you find on top, on top of this, we are making another assumption that the kinematic viscosity divided by time is uh, small, etc. So this is an assumption that was done by Urs Wiedemann and Florschinger. And then you get these, uh, these, these results. So the result that you get is that uh, this X component, the, the one that is uh, perpendicular to the, to the expansion direction has some non-trivial 
spin command, spin chemical potential that goes like this exponential. Let's not get into details, but this is an analytic solution that we can find. And then there is also this uh, M, the other spin chemical potential with one leg on the on the repetitive direction also has some similar expansion, except that this power is different in these in these cases. And once you have that, you can you can go ahead and just um, plug this in in this equation. Assume some kind of Boltzmann distribution. It doesn't really matter because in the end, this is, uh, this is just uh, be going to be absorbed by the overall number. And then you can uh, fix that overall number by one of the terms in the, in the, in the experiment with one, with one of the data points. And the rest for the data points is, uh, is essentially prediction. And it matches um, surprisingly well, because I've been making many crude assumptions, but it is kind of uh, matching the, the, the data surprisingly well. So what, the, what I'm showing here is the, the average polarization that we obtained by, by, by solving hydrodynamic equations with the speaking of the potential given by this blue curve. And these are the, the average uh, points in the, in the first picture that I showed in, the, in this talk of the global uh, uh, lambda and lambda bar polarizations. So I'm matching only the, um, the average of those because we don't have magnetic field in this system. Okay, so this is the final um, result. And um, so, yeah, so since I don't have any time, uh, I will skip this uh, discussion of entropy current. But the only thing that I would like to mention at this order, by assuming that the, the entropy production is positive definite, you're only going to get one condition, one non-trivial condition, which is, uh, which is the fact that um, the, the shear viscos viscosity is positive definite. This is the only thing that you obtain. If you go ahead and it's second order uh, in the derivative expansion, you will get more, more um, conditions on the coefficients, the transport coefficients. But at this level, there is, uh, at this order, there is nothing, nothing in the entropy current. So um, yeah, okay. So I will uh, skip, of course, the, all the holography and so on. Um, let me stop here. Um, thank you very much uh, for your attention. And um, um, yeah, thank you. Thank you for the very nice talk. And let me jump to the uh, end so that I have some um, outlook. Um, let me just show this outlook at least, yeah. Okay, I, I have one more question. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, you know, somehow for me, it's not clear how this, the formalism that you uh, work out is related to, because I think it should be related, possible to relate to, to the Lagrangian formalism by Giorgio. Yeah, I'm not very familiar with the Lagrangian formalism by Giorgio. It should be related. I, I, I definitely agree. And, and this is something that we should uh, sit down and talk with Giorgio, I think. It's... Um, uh, I mean, I think it's related, but um, somehow you guys are more general and more, I'm not, I'm not sure. I mean, if um, torsion is just a bookkeeping, if torsion is just a bookkeeping device, then what is the physical significance of the pseudo gauge chosen by torsion being equal to zero? Uh, well, the phys you see what I'm, you see what I'm asking, right? I mean, the, yeah. So the physical significance is um, is the fact that, yeah. If you're if if you want to formulate the hydrodynamics from this action formalism, I think then um, you don't have much choice. That you have to you have to use torsion as a bookkeeping device because otherwise you have this ambiguity and there's a, you can always choose a gauge where you have uh, you have absolute you have no spin current. Um, but if you, so you have to send it to zero, but you have to, you, you should send it to zero in a, in a specific way. So it's very important where you come from yeah. to that point. I think there. this is like, I think you just use it to, to somehow put order into the symmetries in the system. Exactly, uh, yeah, exactly. This, but this is, this is just the way of doing this. And this is much, the, much useful because if you are starting without something like this, then you pretty much land with something like, you know, Bellinfante problem that you don't have anything. Uh, you just have zero spin densities. Yes, uh, but, but, but I want to emphasize that, that in, this, in this formalism, yeah, I agree with you, but in this formalism, that's, um, 
it is also clear what you see, you concretely see where it plays an important role. So this is precisely those terms that, um, yeah, sorry, just a second, that these, these terms that, that I, I've been showing that these, uh, these terms, for example, are just they are Bellinfante Rosenfeld terms. So those those would be, I mean, in the absence of torsion, you would be able to remove these terms completely. But what I'm saying is that to, to do things consistently, uh, you are not allowed to, to remove these terms, even though they are proportional to distortion, at the end of the game, they do give some contributions to your spin current. And you see concretely where they are coming from. This is precisely the Bellinfante Rosenfeld completion of your uh, spin current. If you want. But let me, just as a sort of, in a sense, you guys are also doing things out with the Lagrangian. I mean, you're calling it a generating function. You're not calling it a Lagrangian, but this is, this is very similar. The question is, shouldn't physics, I mean, the way I see it is that these are ultimately not conservation. What Lagrangians and generating functions give you is they allow you to define hydrodynamics in a way that doesn't depend on conservation laws. And if it doesn't depend on conservation laws, then probably um, the Lagrangian is, if you want, uh, pseudo gauge independent, the dynamics is pseudo gauge independent, but every component is pseudo gauge dependent. In a sense, you fix the gauge and then you call different components by different names. But if you look at the dynamics, they evolve at the same, they, they evolve independently of this. Um, it, this also, this is also what I'm hoping will happen with gauge invariance, right? Once you put in, once, once you put in gauge invariant fields and then what you call vorticity and what you call spin becomes also a gauge dependent quantity, you see what I mean? I mean, I am worried that physics depends on the pseudo gauge or for that matter on the gauge. Um, but it might just be a question of relabeling. It might be that physics is independent of which pseudo gauge you choose, but you simply will uh, um, reparameterize the spin current and the vorticity current uh, depending on the pseudo gauge. That's right. That's yeah. right. So, so I mean, we do have uh, a, an experimental result, right? So there is some spin, there is some global polarization, and but but the question is how do you interpret that data? I think so. You you can you can say so. You see, in a different set of gauge, if you like, I think this this uh, what is that? This equation. So you can you can you can use a different equation for uh, for the global polarization if you want to compare with data. So here I'm I'm putting spin chemical spin potentials here. So you may have you may add you may instead of this you may be using for example um, thermal vorticity. So in the previous equations in um, in Radoslav's paper at Bekatini's paper, so this was like thermal vorticity, I think. But we have seen that the thermal vorticity and the spin potential are becoming the same thing in uh, in in hydrostatic equilibrium. So that's why. This is replacing the this term of vorticity, but th which is also valid. I think this is what I'm the, the kind of point I'm making is that this equation with the spin potential here is more general than uh, hydrostatic equilibrium. It's it's also valid in hydrodynamics. But indeed, I think that kind of ambiguity you are talking about will um, it may be that uh, the physics uh, look like uh, it is pseudo gauge dependent, but it is also there is some additional kind of ambiguity in in uh, in the experiment. How do you define this uh, global polarization? What kind of equation you use here? So you can change this quantity. You can shift it by uh, thermal vorticity or something else, and you can get a different kind of um, answer. But th those two should match each other. I think there should be different formulations of the same physics. But in the end, the the the, the result that you get here, uh, I think this should be independent of, uh, of whatever formalism you're using. So I think in the end, the, the only good thing about the, this this formalism is that it's it's kind of organizing. I mean, as an organizing principle, it it um, you don't miss anything. You know, like th that's the thing that when you write down this uh, hydrodynamic equation, it's really easy to miss terms. But if you have this organizing principle, it it fixes everything for you. So that's that's the nice thing about um, about action formalism with with the torsion. So I don't really, I, I think you should be able to do the same thing using a different formalism, but I don't, I'm not very familiar with that.
I want. Sorry, may I, may oh, I ask you a question, Masoud? Uh, uh, can you explain more about the photograph application to this formalism? Does it add any extra uh, concepts yes. or uh, uh, any other yeah. things to your? Yeah, let me let me say in words. It's. Uh, Yeah, okay, thanks for the question. Um, by the way, I'm going to be happy. I, I'm happy to, to stay here for, for another half an hour and answer questions. I think people, please free, feel free to, to leave uh, because this may take some time, but let me just um, summarize um, holography here. So there are these new concepts, of course. The new, new thing about this is that, um, so, to, to, to describe the, the spin current in the, in the, on the boundary, you need to, so the spin current is sourced by the spin chemical potential, but spin chemical potential should become a, a dynamical degree of freedom in the bulk. Okay, so that you, you should consider some kind of a spin chemical potential wave, which is extended in this holographic direction. And for that, you need to use a completely different formalism of gravity. So in a gravity where the spin connection is, a, is an independent degrees of, degree of freedom. And that is, that is uh, the first order formulation of, uh, of gravity, where you keep this uh, field bind and the spin chemical potential independent. And if you want to do this in an asymptotically ADS space time in five dimensions, mm -hmm. that there are not too many choices. So for example, the standard supergravity is not going to, 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 to give you this. It's going to relate this uh, spin chemical, spin mm -hmm. chemical potential, sorry, the, um, the spin connection to the field bind. By the torsionless condition. So, if you want to, if you if you want, you need to have a torsion full um, holographic description in five dimensions, and that is the the one that we we've, we've been using in this old paper with uh, with Domingo Gallegos. That is a there's a there's a particular kind of gravity, low log John Simons gravity, based on this um, John Simons action in uh, of a non abelian uh, group algebra. That the, the nice thing about this is that this, this, this is a first order formalism where the field bind and the spin co connection are independent. And on top of that, you can generate, you can find um, um, uh, analytic black hole solutions from which you can essentially extract this uh, spin current. And that is, if you like, I mean, I invite you to, to, this, uh, to look at this old paper. There are many new things there, but uh, unfortunately I don't have time to, to talk about that. So essentially I just want, let me just flash some, some of the results that, um, this fixes this, the, the transport coefficients for you, right? So that's mm -hmm. in this particular, so assuming that this kind of five dimensional gravitational theory is due to some kind of uh, plasma, obviously not quark room plasma, but some kind of plasma with spin, uh, the, the transport coefficients in, in, those pl in that plasma is fixed completely by, uh, by, by that act, by the holography. Mm -hmm. I mean, yes, there are new things. Um, So yeah, uh, I'm I'm kind of sorry. I'm I'm not an expert. Isn't supergravity kind of within super gra super gravity is when supersymmetry is locally broken, right? I mean that's how you get it. Yeah. Or and their torsion is sort of it cannot be zero. Uh, uh, well, in, in most of well, I mean in the background, in most of the supergravity backgrounds, it is uh, it is zero, but you can have torsion still. Indeed, I agree. There is room for torsion in, in the Lagrangian. It's non-zero, but you can set a background where it's zero. That's what you're yeah, saying. Yeah, 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 yeah. And the yeah, duality okay. works but, for that background. Okay. I mean, this is right, but that's that's a very good question because indeed, I, this is what I would love to do. I mean, so the kind of it is. So what what I've been showing here is uh, this this action. Uh, it's it's a fancy, nice action, whatever. But it's not what I want actually. This, we were kind of forced to, to study this, uh, this particular action. But what I, in principle, what I would like to do is to, to do a more, um, to, to say, for example, to derive n equals four super young mills with torsion from type two supergravity with, uh, with some kind of a background field, which gives you torsion. For example, that background can come from uh, what is called the cold Brahman field. So it may be possible. I haven't done this yet. But uh, it may be possible to obtain this kind of holographic action suitable for this uh, spin hydrodynamics um, from a more um, ordinary supergravity action. So that, that, that I don't know. It's true. It's true that there is room for torsion there. So um, 
I want to stop the recording of the official part, but people can stay and 